Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, we are glad that you're able to join us. We are um, going to use Slido to collect and upvote questions. So the link is in the chat. Um, if you have any questions as we go along, please go ahead and add it over in the Q&A section of Slido so that we can um, manage everything at the end. Um, and I will now turn it over to the CCSE co-directors, um, Yusuf and Nicholas. Okay, well, um, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Yusuf Marzouk. I'm a professor of aeronautics and astronautics at MIT and co-director of the uh, MIT Center for Computational Science and Engineering, along with my colleague, um, Professor Nicholas Hadjik Constantino. Hi, everyone. Welcome. And uh, the most important here, the most important person here is actually um, Kate Nelson, who is our academic administrator for all the graduate programs of the Center for Computational Science and Engineering. And, um, and I think you may have already been in touch with her as you signed up for this webinar, but we're very pleased that you're all here. And so what we'd like to do over, um, we have about 50 minutes in front of us, we'd like to spend some time uh, just walking through some slides that describe the programs, tell you what the center is about, what the master's and the PhD programs um, that we offer here at MIT are about, talk a bit about admissions, talk a bit about um, the kind of research you might expect to do uh, when you come here, talk a bit about advising and other things like that. And then we'll throw it open to questions. And uh, as, as Kate just mentioned, you know, please put your questions into the Slido site. And then we'll try to walk through um, as many of the questions as we can. Uh, there's a lot of questions there already, but um, you know, more are very welcome. And try to answer those questions in maybe the last you know, 20 or 30 minutes that we have here today. Okay. So, um, okay, the Center for Computational Science and Engineering. Now, so the CCSE, as we call ourselves, is an interdisciplinary center at MIT. Um, we cut across many departments, and as you'll see, we have faculty that cut across um, almost all departments at MIT and most of the schools of MIT, the meaning School of Engineering, School of Science, the College of Computing. Um, formally, um, our center is part of the Schwarzman College of Computing at MIT. Um, and we are primarily um, a, a place for graduate academic programs for students who are interested in developing new computational methods and applying innovative computational methods to problems in science and engineering. And we support that via a master's degree and a PhD degree, and we'll talk a lot about uh, those um, in, in the coming slides. But just to kind of give you a sense of what computational science and engineering is, it's a multidisciplinary field that's, you know, is, is, our, is of interest to people that come from mathematics, people that come from engineering disciplines, people that come from science, people that come from computer science even, but it really sits at the intersection of those things. And this diagram I think here kind of captures it very well. This is actually drawn from a really nice article in Siam Review about research and educational in research and education in computational science and engineering. This article came out a couple of years ago, but in some sense, it really kind of attempts to define the field for people coming from a variety of different areas. Maybe they haven't seen CSE specifically before. But CSE is really something that sits at this intersection of it involves science and engineering problems and many methods and applications that come from science and engineering. Made motive, many motivations from science and engineering. It involves a bit of applied mathematics, maybe even some statistics to help develop the underlying methodologies. And it involves a bit of computer science because ultimately this is about computing and maybe implementing things at scale and scientific computing. I mean, it, it mixes together all these things to develop new computational methods in service of um, scientific insights and engineering advances. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So, a bit more specifically, um, within our center at MIT, some of the research areas uh, that we cover, and this really is research that our graduate students do in collaboration with faculty members in the Center for Computational Science and Engineering in their own labs and in their own research groups. And this is, these are kind of broad headings, but these cover a lot of what we do. So one is, for instance, computational modeling and simulation. So basically simulating the physical world, simulating complicated systems, whether it's traffic and transportation, whether it's molecular dynamics, whether it's quantum chemistry simulations, whether it's fluid simulations, solid mechanics, structures, failure, um, safety, all these things when you're simulating, when you're developing models and, and running them on the computer, when you're doing simulation, that's a key part of what we do. Um, numerical algorithms and scientific computing. So numerical analysis, high performance computing, um, scientific computing at scale and, and, and both kind of 
algorithms and software and mathematical analysis that underlies that is, is a big part of what we do. Um, uncertainty quantification. So this is kind of close to my heart. This is what I work in research-wise. But in some sense, asks, try to answer, tries to answer the question of, yes, you can simulate things on the computer. Yes, you can make predictions about the physical world, but how good are they? And how can you inform them by data? I guess that gets into the next category. But how can you say something about the, the quality, whether, it's, whether it comes from a numerical error or modeling error in the computational predictions that you produce? And so that's an interesting field that really synthesizes statistics with applied mathematics with science and engineering applications. Um, learning from data is maybe the fourth pillar here. And this is a hugely important field. Um, this includes um, sort of data assimilation, inverse problems, parameter estimation, but also of course machine learning applied to science and engineering applications. So this is of course a hot area now, but you know what we do in the context of computational science and engineering is generally trying to understand how can we blend physical principles with data-driven methods and use us to create things that are greater than the sum of the parts. Um, so machine learning applied to science and engineering problems is certainly of interest. And then optimization and design. So very often computational simulations aren't just used to say, you know, predict what's going to happen. They're used to design a process, whether to design an airplane, design an airfoil, um, design a transportation system, um, design uh, new materials. This involves questions of optimization and design, searching over large spaces and trying to figure out, um, you know, what configurations, what, what kind of, you know, thing that you want to realize in the physical world gives you best performance. So all of these are part of, you know, the broad umbrella of things that we do in CCSE. And I should say that if you want to find more about this, um, you not go to our webpage and also look at the faculty members who are listed on the webpage, because going to each faculty member's site or looking them up independently will give you a sense of the kind of research that they're engaged in, and thus the kind of research that you might be able to do if you were to come and, and join us here at MIT. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, yeah, so here, here's an important note. Um, so this is a, a common source of confusion just because the names are quite similar. Many people think, oh, CSE, computer science. So one thing we wanna emphasize is that these are not computer science programs. MIT has different computer science programs. And if you're interested in computer science, if you're interested in you know, compilers and programming languages or theoretical computer science or systems or um, you know, databases or things like that, um, or if you're interested in sort of machine learning purely in the context of kind of computer science and modeling consumer behavior or social preferences or things like that, then CSE is actually not the appropriate program for those interests. CSE is really computational science and engineering, as I explained um, on the previous uh, slide. These lead to degrees in computational science and engineering, and they really have a different research and education focus than uh, MIT's computer science program. So if you're interested in computer science programs, there's great programs also at MIT, um, as good as the CSE programs, um, but you should apply to those uh, programs directly. And again, this uh, article that we referenced here on the slide, I think makes some of those distinctions clear if you're wondering about where you might best fit. Um, beyond that, I should say, you know, in terms of background, we take in students who have backgrounds in, in, in every engineering discipline, in the physical sciences, in applied mathematics, maybe even statistics, um, double majors, people with hybrid backgrounds in these things. Um, but uh, in general, the, that background is a bit different maybe than the, than the background that would lead to a pure computer science degree. And you'll think you'll see that also in, as you, we look talk through the course requirements and what the programs are about. I think that'll make some of these di distinctions more clear. Nicholas, I don't know if there's anything you wanna add here, things I might've missed in describing this. Oh, no, so far it's all very clear, I think. Okay, <clears throat> let's jump to the next slide. Okay, so do you wanna sure. hit this one? Okay. Yeah, sure. so as, as Yusuf explained, we have uh, two degree offerings, a master's of science program and a PhD. They are a little bit different in the sense that the science uh, Master of Science program is uh, standalone. We administer it and we are completely responsible for it. And um, it really um, is part of the uh, Shortman College. And so this is an interdisciplinary program which uh, provides a strong foundation in computational approaches as, uh, and covers all the areas that Yusef um, described before. 
And um, masters, like all masters programs uh, at MIT, require you to take uh, six graduate classes and do a thesis. Um, we strongly uh, encourage and advise students to take about uh, two classes uh, per semester. So that means you can complete the six class requirement in, in three semesters. And you also need to work with an advisor uh, to uh, do your uh, thesis, which takes also about um, um, one and a half to two years. So from time to completion for this um, program is one and a half to two years. Uh, it's mathematically possible in one and a half years. Uh, sometimes the research does not cooperate, but, um, and so it might take a little bit longer. But uh, I really wanna highlight uh, this point um, once again. Um, this is a substantial piece of research. It's quite different from many other um, degree um, programs in other universities. Some of those are, are completely taught. You just take classes. Here, you actually have to do um, a significant uh, piece of research. And uh, we're actually uh, very proud about that, that it actually is a very good warm up uh, for your PhD. So as far as curriculum goes, um, the curriculum has a, a common core from which you have to select three out of four uh, classes. And then you have to take two restricted electives from a long list of um, specialized subjects in computation. And then you have one unrestricted elective. So that makes up the, the six classes. And you get um, usually class, graduate classes at MIT at 12 units each for a total of 72 units. And your thesis counts for 36 units, even though, uh, and that's a uh, peculiarity of MIT, um, typically uh, the amount of work you have to do for your thesis is more or less the same as uh, taking those six classes, even though it counts for half in terms of units. But that should also give you a sense for um, when I say it's a substantial piece of work, how much work it is. It's the equivalent of six graduate classes at MIT. Um, that's it for the uh, master's program. If we can go to the PhD and then we can um, um, talk about them and answer questions later. So <clears throat> the PhD program is, is slightly different in the sense that it's not standalone. It's offered jointly with home departments. And we have eight home departments that offer this program. Aeronautics and astronautics, chemical engineering, civil environmental engineering, um, material science and engineering, nuclear science and engineering, and mechanical engineering. Those are in the School of Engineering. And then we have two that are in the School of Science, mathematics, and earth atmospheric and planetary science. So what does it mean to be a joint a home department. Basically, you apply to the PhD program through our center. Your, uh, your application is looked at, and if it satisfies the general computational requirements, then it's forwarded to one of these, to, to a depart the home department you designate. And then you are also admitted into that department. <clears throat> Once you are admitted into that department, then you're essentially a student of that department, but your curriculum varies a little bit from the standard students in that department. For example, if you're in mechanical engineering, you're of course admitted to do computation. So you will have to satisfy some of the requirements for mechanical engineering, but your path slightly is slightly different. You have to take <clears throat> a qualifying exam that's tailored to that. And then you have to, for your major, um, typically you have to take uh, five graduate level subjects from the approved CSE list. Your uh, thesis committee will have a requirement depending on the department. Um, it would be either that your thesis committee chair needs to be a CCSE member or um, a number of members from your thesis committee need to be CCSE members. And then <clears throat> the way your specialization in computation is recognized is um, your degree in the end does not say uh, uh, the thesis field is not the home department name, which is usually the case. It is a specially crafted uh, thesis field, which includes computation. So for example, in mechanical engineering, somebody who completes a PhD in mechanical engineering, their diploma says PhD in mechanical engineering. If you are in the CSC program, your diploma will say mechanical engineering 
and computation. And each one of these eight participating departments has a specially crafted thesis field that you get if you satisfy these particular requirements. The most significant of which is that, of course, you will be doing computational thesis and you have to take five graduate subjects that are in the approved CSC list. And you can find that on the website. Um, does that cover it, Yusuf? Yeah, I think so. Um, also, the, the names of the specially crafted thesis fields are also on the website. Uh, there's sort of a, a description of the, of the particulars of each um, departmental um, agreement with CSC. Great. So I uh, can move on to the next page. The application process. Uh, Kate, do you want to talk about that or should we talk about that? Sure. So there's um, separate deadlines for the master's and the PhD. The PhD deadline comes up first. That's December 15th. Um, the master's is January 10th. The applications are not identical, but they are very, very similar. Um, so for the PhD program only, you're selecting a home department, um, or you may indicate also a secondary home department that you're interested in. Um, in both cases, we're asking for you to provide suggested faculty readers, which are CCSE affiliated faculty whose research is of the most interest to you. Um, so that is really, I think, an important point that we're looking for CCSE folks in, in those fields. Um, and if you're a PhD candidate and you're listing multiple departments, you could list faculty from each department um, if, if you're able to find folks that match up with your interests. Just um, a note, I'll, I'll interject on that. Um, if you're applying, and of course, like as you probably hopefully know, it's good to mention to, to list these faculty readers and also to mention some of the faculty, the, some, some of the same faculty or faculty whom you might want to work with in your statement of purpose, um, in your statement of objectives. If you're having a hard, so usually that's quite natural and you'll find people who are CCSE affiliated um, in the home departments that you select whom you'd want to work with. If you're having a hard time doing that, then um, that's kind of an indication that maybe um, you haven't picked the right home department or if you're applying to the master's program, so you could pick any CCSE affiliated faculty if for some reason you can't find CCC affiliated faculty um, to list, then probably you're applying to the wrong program. So this is, a, it should sort of come naturally, of course, you know, do your homework, look at the website, see who's working on what. Um, but in general, that, that would indicate a good fit if these names come naturally. Absolutely. Then um, continuing on for the requirements for transcripts, we are not looking for an official transcript yet. Um, when you submit your application, we just want a PDF of an unofficial transcript. And we really only want the PDF. I, we're not looking for hard copy things right now. Um, and we would be requesting hard copy transcripts from admitted students. So we're hoping that that will save you some time and money and not having to send along a million transcripts um, everywhere. So another um, thing that we're looking for in both applications is three letters of recommendation. I know that there are some questions about um, who those should be from. I don't know if we want to address that now or move on. Um, um, we can, yeah, we'll, we'll address it later because I'm okay. sure it's also in the questions. Yeah. Yes, it is, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're looking for a statement of objectives that is roughly a page, um, maybe a bit longer. We can talk about this a little bit more in a minute. Um, a resume or CV, international students um, who are from non-English speaking countries. We're also looking for a test of your English language proficiency, which is either the IELTS or the TOEFL. Um, as part of the COVID accommodations, we'll accept the TOEFL at home test as well. Um, and then I want to just make a note that if there's, you know, if you're from a, a country like India, where English wasn't necessarily your, your native language, but it was your language of education, then you're not required to submit that test score. Um, and if there, there's more information about that on our website. And um, right within each application, there's a checkbox to indicate that you um, qualify for the waiver. So you don't need to get a formal written confirmation from us that you don't need to take it. Just if you satisfy that requirement, then you can just check the box right within the application and we'll know um, from your transcript and your educational history that that's why you 
satisfy the requirement. Um, and then lastly is our application fee, um, which is $75. Um, I know someone asked about a fee waiver and within the questions, there's a link to the um, webpage where there's information about that. We can't control fee waivers ourselves. Um, so that needs to come from the Office of Graduate Education and they have certain cri criteria that you have to meet to be eligible for a fee waiver. Um, so that essentially is the application. Um, they are reviewed on a um, pretty lengthy basis. So the review period runs from deadline, December or January, depending on which you're applying to, through March. Um, and we release decisions as soon as we can, um, which means that they come out on a rolling basis. And I just wanna highlight that, that if someone you know got a decision and you haven't, it doesn't mean anything. It just means that we release them um, you know, rolling as we know. Um, and there's a lot involved in reviewing graduate applications. There's a lot of people that are looking at them, um, not computers, but actual people are reading these files. So it's a lengthy process and um, it doesn't all happen at once. Um, and Nicholas, you know, so I don't know if you wanna add anything else about the actual application process or. I, I, I would like to, this is not part of the applications, but this is something that you have to think about. Um, we offer a master's in computation and a PhD, and your background and objectives and career objectives should factor uh, quite a bit into what you apply to. For example, if you are, uh, it, it also, uh, other thing that factor is the what the process in participating departments is. For example, if you are in a mathematics department currently and you want to apply to the, um, to the mathematics department for the PhD, you have the option of doing the master's, but if you apply to the PhD, then you could enroll into the PhD um, CSE uh, program. If you are in an engineering department, and you would like to know about computation, but you do have no background, then you have the option of joining uh, the CSE SM, which is going to be focused quite a bit on computation, or you have the option of applying to the, say, the mechanical engineering department, in which case you will be doing a mechanical engineering master's, and then you could do a CSE PhD. So depending on what your background is, you have various options here and um, the combinations are very varied. I don't think we can enumerate them all, but uh, all I want to point out is that um, depending on what your background is, you may want to do a CSE DSM, which is really focused on computation, but it brings you into the interdisciplinary mold uh, in, in your thesis, but it's focused on computation, or you have the option of, or, or, of joining one of the departments, which will be more disciplinary based. And so it really depends a lot on what background you have to which of these programs you apply. Yeah. I'll, I'll add one thing to that and hopefully I don't um, make anything confusing, but I mean, the decisions that you face at this stage are, should I apply to the masters or should I apply to the PhD? And as Nicholas described, that kind of depends on your background and of course your long-term goals. Do you want to just you know, do a research-based master's for two years and then go work? Do you want to do research-based master's for two years and then decide if longer term the research career and life is good for you? Then maybe again, the master's is indicated. On the other hand, if you know, you know this is what you want to do, you're in it for the long haul, you're willing to spend five years then, and you have a bit of prior research experience, then yes, go ahead and apply for the PhD. Um, once you apply for the PhD, um, this is where sort of some complication arises. Um, some departments require a master's on the way to a PhD and others do not. Um, I know for instance, like AeroAstro, my department does, mechanical engineering generally does, um, but some other departments, uh, for instance, material science and engineering does not, mathematics does not, um, earth atmospheric and planetary sciences does not. So Chemical engineering also is not, they're sort of straight to PhD. Um, so I guess maybe the majority of departments when you apply for PhD, you go straight to PhD. Others will just, you do a master's along the way. 
Um, but that's just sort of the tradition of those departments. And it's been like that for I mean, half a century, probably at MIT, if not longer. Um, but in any case, um, that's a decision that's department specific, but the decision you make at the outset is I'm gonna apply for masters, I'm gonna apply for PhD. If PhD, what one or two home departments am I gonna select? Yeah, and I should just add that there is a checkbox within the PhD application if you would like to also be considered for the master's so that you don't have to submit a second um, complete application. Yeah. Okay. So um, many options. It's very, very <laughs> 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 I should make a diagram of the loops. <laughs> yes. Okay. So then, um, you know, there's usually some questions about um, both statement and letters. So we can move on to that, but I guess statement first. Um, I just really like to remind students that this is your time to speak directly to the faculty readers. Um, so you want to be respectful of their time. They're reading a lot of applications. Be concise, um, be specific, and um, try to be um, clear in making sure that things match. So returning back to that suggested faculty reader block at the beginning of the application, um, make sure that that is consistent with what you're putting in your statement um, so that you're not confusing your readers and leaving them wondering what it is that you're actually interested in. Um, and you know, you're, you're gonna want to make sure that you're writing a statement for each program that you're applying to um, so that you can really tailor it to that program. Um, and then I should also note within our application, if you are applying to the Department of Material Science and Engineering, there are some specific questions that um, are for applicants of that department. So they're looking for um, specific answers. And if you're not applying to that department, then you do not need to provide that information in the application. Um, so, um, so I think, oh, can, I, can I, yeah, so, um, this, this should hopefully also uh, touch upon a number of the questions. Um, both the statement of purpose and the recommendation letters. Um, um, the emphasis here is for uh, graduate school. So it's not uh, quite the same as applying to for your undergraduate education. Um, clearly academic performance is important. It shows that uh, you're interested in the subject. It also shows us that we that you have the background, so uh, you will not find you know the things we're going to be teaching you here completely new and difficult. So we're interested in your um, um, academic performance in undergraduate, but um, there's new dimensions that we care about here. The graduate program is a lot about um, research, solving open-ended problems. So both in the letters and in your statement of purpose, we wanna see excitement for tackling difficult open-ended problems. We wanna see evidence that you're good at it, either somebody in your letter saying that I gave this person a research problem and they did extremely well, or you know the way you talk about things, you show that you understand the field and what the open problems are and excitement for solving a class of them. So these are the sort of things that we wanna see because as we said, research becomes progressively more important. There's substantial research already in the SM and classes and doing well in, well in homeworks and quizzes becomes progressively less important. So your statement should, you, you need to write it with this general idea in mind that you need to convince the person who's reading it that this person would be an excellent researcher in somebody's lab. That's great. Okay. So um, I guess with that, we can move on to questions. So there are already several in the Slido, which is great. Um, so if you haven't had a chance yet, you can pop over to slido.com and use that code or the link that's in the chat um, and upvote or enter questions. Um, the more you upvote, the better we can make sure that we're going through the ones that are of most interest. So that would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, I guess we can just jump right in. So um, the first question is asking um, for honors, prizes, research experience, et cetera. Are we supposed to copy the information from the CV or make it shorter and more detailed? 
So um, I will just quickly respond from my end and then I guess let you, Nicholas Nisa, if you have any other thoughts. But basically this, I know that your CV is there, but the way that our application is structured from our end, um, getting to your CV is an extra click. Um, and when you're a faculty member, every extra click when you're reading a lot of applications takes time. Um, so by entering the information there, it's making it easier for our faculty. Um, so duplicating things on your end just makes life easier for them. So you can copy and paste exactly how you have it, or you know, if, if that taking it out of context of your CV seems then disjointed, you can you know tweak things so that it seems to make the most sense to you. I don't know, yeah. Nicholas, so if it, you know, as a reviewer, what your thoughts are. Yeah, I, I think it, it's fine to duplicate. In fact, it, it, it can help, but it, but it should be pretty distilled. Um, I mean, in that section, if you write like, you know, a whole wall of text, um, that probably, I think, does less of a service than you think. So I think just kind of, you know, bulleted, keep it short and to the point, give us your top things. We're trying to paint a picture. Um, yeah. Um, Let's see, what level of research experience are you looking for in SM applicants? Is it substantially more for PhD applicants? Um, it, it, it depends. I mean, to some extent, like SM versus PhD depends on what you want to do afterwards, but it does depend a bit on your background. I'd say in all applicants, it would be good to have some research experience. Research experience, as Nicholas was just describing, reflects your ability to solve an open-ended problem, to kind of you know make sense out of something that's messy, to be self-guided, um, to, to exhibit the characteristics of a good graduate student. Um, but generally, yeah, maybe the expectations are a bit higher for the PhD than for the master's, um, but some research experience helps in, in all regards. Um, yeah. In some sense, the, the onus for making good decisions is, is on us, because if we make the good decisions, then we're gonna get there. The greatest applicant, the, the greatest students, and then we're all gonna have a good time. So, so we're being we 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 do a lot of thinking when we read those applications. So even if it's from PhD application, from student to student, we need to be we need to think critically about the application. So if you're applying to a PhD program, but you are still an undergraduate the requirement will be different than if you're applying to a PhD program and you have a master's, right? Yeah. Because we say, oh, this person has a master's, they've done something already. So perhaps there should be a publication there. Or right. perhaps there should be letters saying that they did some work and they did well. If you're an undergraduate, then the bar is, is certainly lower. It's different, yeah. Different, right? Um, yeah. We're still gonna see what's there, but, um, we, we, we can even check where you were and what opportunities you had to do research at the place that you were as an undergraduate. So all of these things factor in. We wanna pick the most qualified applicants. And so we, we, we do this carefully and we apply what we think are fair filters for doing that. Yeah. One question that came up, um... And if this is, I don't know if this is a good idea to answer or not, um, but this comes up. Um, is it recommended to contact professors that we're interested in? Um, and does prior contact affect the consideration of our application, if at all? Um, you know, I, I, I should let Nicholas also answer this because different people might have different opinions. Um, I would say in general, no, it does not help. Um, and that, you know, we look at every application, we look at the application itself as it comes in. We look at the, the, the what you wrote, we look at your record, we look at the letters. Um, having had prior contact in advance does not help. And in some cases, I don't know if you have a chance, I mean, we get a lot of emails as individual faculty from people and individual professors do not admit people. The admissions committees and processes admit people. Um, so in that sense, I think prior contact can be a bit more annoying than helpful. Um, in most cases. That, that, that's my personal view. <laughs> I don't know, Nicholas. But... My, my personal view is the same. If I get contacted before I say, first you have to be admitted by the admissions committee before you can talk about joining my group. Therefore, first do your application. Yeah. Now, yeah. If, you happen, yeah, if you happen to have some type of interaction with somebody, for example, you could be an undergraduate in the same department, right? 
mm-hmm. that's not going to be held against you. But yeah. in general, trying to contact faculty before you are admitted to the department won't get you anything. Yeah, put your effort into the application. Just kind of contact for the sake of contact is not um, is not helpful. Um, let's see. Um, what are the best types of references? Is a previous employer's recommendation more valued than a professor's? Um, I would say actually the most valuable recommendations are from people who've worked with you in a research capacity and who can speak to your ability to solve an open-ended problem, to be self-motivated, um, to think deeply about something. Um, and, and so I think, you know, in some sense, faculty with whom you've done research are always very good uh, recommenders. Um, it rec- if you only had recommendations from um, supervisors in industry or at a job, I think that actually can be less helpful. I think it's good to have some recommendations from people who are calibrated to the academic setting and to what's valued in an academic research setting. Um, so I would keep that in mind as well. And so with that said, if you have two academic references and then you're trying to decide between a professor who had you in class and barely knew you and, you know, but you did well in the class. So they're going to say, oh, I had this person in my class and they got an A. Uh, We can see that in the transcript. So that's not very useful. If you have uh, something from industry who said, uh, you know, it wasn't research, but we gave this person a, a very difficult problem and they solved it and they had to be creative and they will have to work hard and they had to be self-motivated, that counts. So yeah. academic references are clearly better, but it also, again, depends on the context. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Um... Okay, can we include the name of a professor in the statement of person who's not affiliated with um, CCSE? Um, you can, you can write anything you want, but I think it's not terribly helpful um, to include the name of a faculty member who's not affiliated with the program. Um, if, you fi- if you find that you're unable to find professors whose research interests match your own, who are also affiliated with CCSE, um, then that's an indicator maybe you should apply to programs that those professors are affiliated with. And there's like, there's about 70 faculty affiliated with CCSE. So it's a pretty broad, uh, pretty broad umbrella at MIT. Um, let's see. If my prospective supervisor is out of funding this year, will I be directly rejected? Um, no, <laughs> um, it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> um, there's, there's, first of all, there's a variety of methods of support. Um, research assistantships are one, and by far the majority of graduate students are supported by research assistantships. There are also some fellowships, both internal, external, and there's also teaching assistantships. Also, um, it's good to have in mind, you know, if there's one person you want to work with and you absolutely want to work with that person, that's great, but it's possible that that one person, maybe their group is full, maybe they're going on sabbatical, maybe they're just not taking students that year. Um, so it's good to be a little bit more flexible than that and have, you know, two or three or a handful of people whom you might be able to work with. Um, I think if you put all your eggs in that one basket for a variety of reasons, not necessarily funding, but other reasons that are really out of our control, um, that student may simply not be taking people. Um, and then even if you are admitted, you may not be able to work with the person with whom you want to work. So I think it, it, it's, it's good to think more broadly and to think about um, if you are admitted, who are several people whom you might want to, whom you might be interested in working with? Let's see. Do we need to have extensive computational experience during our studies, such as MPI implementation or studied courses for parallel computing? Uh, no, uh, that's the you know I think more than you know that's great if that's what you're interested in that's fantastic. Um, but you know by no means do we expect that of people coming in and as people who to be honest, we'll go through their whole CSE program without ever having touched MPI. Um, that's just a particular you know, line of work. Some people do it, some people don't, but that's not sort of intrinsic to um, what we do. Some people are focused on parallel computing, others um, couldn't parallel compute their way out of a paper bag. I mean, it just really depends. So, um, let's see. 
Nicholas, what, what questions are coming up for you? I'm not sure I was looking. Um, the same one at the top, um, what's the average number of students accepted? Um, and that is a very muddy, it depends. Um, there is no average number that we aim for, um, especially in the PhD program where we're working with eight different departments and eight different admissions committees. Um, it really varies year to year and it depends on the candidates themselves. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I, more than five, less than less than fifty. <laughs> it's kind of uh... so. So I think th this question that has to do with um, the project, I think, is is a good one because we haven't touched upon funding. Um, the question is: Do I have to do something which is directly related to the prospective supervisors group, as mentioned in the statement? Purpose: Can I propose new but related research direction? So. Um, in your statement of purpose, you, you don't have to propose yourself problems. Uh, you can say what your interests are, and that will help us match you with uh, professors who have uh, research interest and open problems in that general area. Uh, yes, we, I guess, touched upon uh, funding usually comes from research assistantships. That is the professors secure funding to do this work and they use it to pay you to work on the research project. So that's the vast majority of students are supported by research assistantships. So it's the, it's the faculty's um, responsibility to propose the projects and secure the funding for it. Um, in that sense, if you accept the research assistantship, you are in some sense bound to working on that project. Um, the best students are the students who take that project and then uh, find novel ways to deliver what's required, extend it beyond, find even more interesting applications of that work. That's all open, open-ended and that's what we are looking for. But um, re, um, reformulating the project to something you're personally interested in is not um, what probably the supervisor wants. The pro supervisor is on the hook for what they proposed. So if you want to do something that interests you, you can be upfront with the, the advisors you talk to and you say, I want to work on this. But then they will, that would probably mean that they will not financially support you. They may be able to supervise you if they find it interesting, but they may not be able to support you. In which case, you can use teaching assistantships to support yourself or a fellowship. Perhaps this problem is uh, an op a very interesting one and you have somebody, uh, some outside source, be able to fund it. And you can come to MIT with your own funding to do this, in which case you're only looking for a supervisor. So um, hopefully this clarifies how funding works um, at MIT. Uh, I will also say that even though these other funding uh, modes are available, research assistantships are typically the most common and probably the best for you because you're being paid to work on a research project, which will ultimately lead to a thesis. A teaching assistantship, you're being paid for teaching in the class. So that, that is, could be very fulfilling, especially if you're interested in, in becoming an educator, uh, even in academia later on. But it doesn't directly lead to your thesis. So your thesis work has to happen on the side, right? So that's, that's more work towards your thesis because you have a, basically a second job. So research assistantship is the way to go. And then you, you ask professors who has funding, what that funding is for, and then you decide whether that project is of interest to you. And if it's of interest to you and you make an agreement that this, is, this person is gonna be your supervisor, then you have to work on what you agreed on. I hope this clarifies the funding situation. One question that came in, um, okay, if you don't have any research experience, but you want to apply it to the program because of industry experience, 
Um, you know, I think uh, it, it depends on the kind of industry experience that you're talking about. I mean, there, there are problems in industry that, are, that begin to approach research in the sense that you're really trying to investigate something get to the bottom of something, really tackling with an open, uh, tackling an open-ended problem. And so obviously the closer you can get to that kind of problem and the more experience you have with that kind of problem, um, the better kind of preparation you are likely to have for a research-based academic program. Um, that said, I mean, if you really don't have any research experience, then um, certainly I think then, for, you know, if you're otherwise, you know, have a compelling case and, and, and are well qualified, then the master's program would be a better fit. Uh, to apply to initially, um, because that's one where you could get the research experience. But maybe even back as an undergrad, you had some research experience or something like that that you could point to, or some independent work that you've done. Um, this also has been upvoted a lot. It's a rather difficult question to answer. What's the average academic impact of admitted first year PhD students, number of publications, number of citations? Again, there, there's absolutely no quote, there's no number, there's no mold, there's no sort of um, sort of numerical bar here. And when it says, I mean, as Kate said, the applications are not read by computers. They're read by people that are really trying to assess the totality of your experience, your academic background, the opportunities that you may have been exposed to um, and what you've done with them. And so it's not really, um, yeah, I don't think it's really kind of, um, there's nothing really we can say about a specific number or expected impact in that sense. So I see a question about GRE scores. Um, in fairness uh, to people who did not take the GRE because we do not ask for them, uh, our policy is that we do not consider anybody's GRE scores. Kate, okay. you wanna talk about the CSE student community? Sure, um, yeah, so we have a student group um, and we also have a uh, student SIAM chapter at MIT. So between the two, our students are, are pretty active. Um, they are physically quite spread out across campus typically, um, but they come together for um, events that either the student group will organize or SIAM organizes, or we at the center organize um, things like monthly distinguished seminars, um, student talks, social events, that kind of thing. Um, we also at MIT have student groups for just about every imaginable activity. So um, you have a chance to get involved with other CSC students in, you know, in an academic setting in, in that group. And you also have the chance to get involved in whatever interests you with other students who are also interested in that. Um, so you know, there's really more than we could possibly cover here, but um, the point is, whatever you're into, there is probably a club for it. And if there's not, you can start one and probably other people will join you very shortly. So. Yeah. Um, there's one question about getting admission um, in MIT under a professor different than the one uh, mentioned in the statement. Um, I'd like to clarify that just to give a, few, a little more information on how the system works. Uh, the, the, the system as we said before, is um, admission is based on a, on a committee recommendation without necessarily um, being admitted under a particular professor. You're admitted to CCSCSM, for example, and then you, you look for a supervisor. You look for a supervisor because you need to have a supervisor, but you also look for a supervisor because you need to secure funding. Um, and then you, if you're admitted, there is um, no, um, you, you're, you're not required to work with the person you mentioned in the statement of purpose. You don't have to mention anybody in the statement of purpose. You could only say what your interests are. Um, you just, if you're admitted, then you're free to, to look around and talk to as many professors as you like. And then you make a decision, which is a mutual one um, uh, with, with the professor that has the funding and a project that interests you and that professor would like to hire you. So there's no connection, the answer. Let's see, is it compulsory for the statement of purpose to be one page? Is it acceptable to be two pages? Um, sure, I think, uh, it, I think the thought is don't make it so long. And recall that people are reading 
many applications. So follow rules of good writing, be straightforward, concise to the point, but say what you need to say. Um, and just uh, bear in mind that people will be reading hundreds of applications and uh, you don't want your ideas to get lost in an overly long statement, but there's no you know, hard cutoff. Um, one or yeah. two other questions. One or two more questions. I'm trying to see what's been upvoted here. Um, is third year of undergrad considered too late to start research for an applicant? Uh, no, it's never too late, um, but start. Um, how does the admissions, go ahead. Yeah, varied interests are fine. Um, you don't, know, the, the, the statement is not a contract. Right, varied interests are fine. Just like Yusuf said, and I think I said, it's the totality of the package that you present that makes the case that you know you're gonna do well in the program. So if if you don't have to explain that you're dying to work on a particular thing to make your application stronger. Let's see, and maybe last one: Should the thesis research uh, be related to expanding knowledge of the three core subjects, or can it be interdisciplinary? Um, Absolutely, it can be interdisciplinary, and more often than not, it is. The core subjects are kind of foundational things, you know, optimization, numerical simulation, numerical linear algebra, that you need to be able to do, you know, work in CSE. Uh, but the research, you know, those are the building blocks. The research is often, you know, far up ahead at the forefront. So, and the forefront these days is interdisciplinary. So, you know, very often it's like that. All right, well, we are up with our time. So um, yeah. hope everybody, I just want to thank you all for coming and um, listening to this and submitting your questions. Um, we appreciate your time and interest and um, we look forward to hearing from many of you in, in the coming admission cycle. Thank you. Great. Great to virtually meet all of you and good luck. <laughs>